Welcome, I'm Rose Martin, and we're right around the corner with Robin Sean. Our boy, are you in for a treat? This woman is so contagiously infectious, her attitude, her excitement, and I can't wait to chat with her about her book. Let me tell you a little bit about her. So the more time I spend with Robin, the more I appreciate how multi-talented she is. With degrees from Bluefield College and Holland University, this dynamo has spent her professional life marketing and managing live entertainment and sports in coliseums. But on her personal side, she loves practical jokes, margaritas, and everything about the 80s. From Pat Benatar to Shakespeare, Cicero, Poe, and Faulkner, Robin loves everything about the arts, Broadway musicals, and anything Puccini. She's happy singing in a rock band and in her church. She's passionate about animal welfare, and you know, you may see her riding her motorcycle on the Blue Ridge Parkway. She's a Michigan State football fan, but I'm not going to hold that against her, being an Ohio State <laughs> fan myself. So, Robin Sean, wow, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is so exciting, Rose, you know, to get a chance to spend some time with you and to talk about some of the arts and a little bit of... Um, the other side of me that most people don't get to see. And let's start there because this other side of you is beautiful poetry and art. How did the book come about? Well, some of the poetry written and, and published in that particular volume uh, was written probably 10, I've got a couple poems in there 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Some of them were written as early as maybe two years ago, a year ago. It, it's unique how, what motivated me to put this collection together. I, I'd always called it Poetry of the Wind, um, uh, or Portrait of the Wind, I'm sorry, so that, you know, people could kind of get a visual of words, and that's hard when you marry images and words. And I think I was motivated last winter when I think everybody around Roanoke knew that um, our friend Caroline Hammond lost her daughter, Sarah Beth Rose Hammond, in a tragic car accident um, around Christmas. And I had met that young lady who was 16 years old mm -hmm. one time. And she was so artistic and creative. And I just knew, wow, if she had a chance to make it as far in life as I did, she would have published 10 portraits of the wind already. Mm -hmm. So what was stopping me? And um, so I just had to sit down and do a little personal reflection and think, you know, what am I waiting for? Who am I waiting for? I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So I did it. And that's the first of what I think is two, maybe three volumes of poetry. Oh, good. We're going to look forward to that. I noticed in your dedication that it's very personal to the people who've helped you heal. Is yes. there anyone in particular, or what's the meaning behind that? You know, I um, I have one really good friend. His name's Jim. We've been like brother and sister for over 30 years. And I just realized recently that he has been the rock in my life when every, everybody else has been a pebble. You know, he has been that person that I pick up the phone and call. It's not a romantic relationship. It's one of those people that, you know, it's even better than that. Mm -hmm. It's so <laughs> solid. Um, and and soulful. Um, I think he has kicked me in the backside more than one time to uh, take that next step that, you know, and to be brave, take that next step in life. I remember one time we were having breakfast at IHOP and this was many years ago and I was considering going to get my master's degree and had thought, oh, I'm just gonna go to XYZ University and I'm just gonna get an MBA. And he goes, I'm sorry, did you say MBA? I mean, that's not who you are. Who you are writes poetry and short stories and children's lit and things like that. Why would you do that? And I got up from the table and went straight to the graduate studies uh, office at Hollins University and registered for their master's class. And it was one of the best moves I ever made. I said, who knew that one breakfast at IHOP would change my life? And it really did change my life because it gave me, I think, a sense of uh, self reflection or self-worth that I had not considered before. It's always Robin, the entertainment uh, person, the general manager, the marketing person, the sports person, you know, tied to a facility. It was never Robin who I am introvertly. And um, I just appreciate IHOP 
not so much for the pancakes as mm -hmm. I do <laughs> the conversation that's you know developed out of some of those breakfasts. <laughs> and so this really is a peek inside that private robin. Those pieces of robin that have gone on these journeys that you so beautifully capture in your words and on these pages. Thank you so much. So, when you think about that robin, it had to be a pretty vulnerable moment to put these out for everybody after you've kept them so close. You know, that is a very good point. Poetry is so different than even probably writing a memoir. A memoir, you know, you're going to expose it all and you're going to tell the details as best as you can recall them, but poetry is one of those things that didn't rely on anyone else. It didn't rely really on anyone else's dialogue. It, it totally relies on your feelings, your experiences, and, and what developed out of that. How do you put your experience into words? And, you know, instead of writing a story about it, how do you say the most with the, with the least amount of words that you possibly can that will matter to someone? You know, I, I felt like in this collection of poetry, too, you don't have to take a, uh, you know, a class on how to define poetry or a poetry interpretation course. You don't have to do that. I put my feelings kind of out there in layman's terms a lot of the times so that what it meant to me may mean something different to someone else, may mean something different to another person, but it it's not so complicated that you can't translate it into your own experience, whether it's a good one or a bad one. Hmm. And you know, I'm curious, when you talk about those experiences being good or bad in the journey that goes mm -hmm. along with it, so many of these poems take uh, the reader on a journey through whatever life is tossing at them, right? Right. Right, it really does. You know, I have one poem in here um, called The Art of Letting Go, and you know, I have realized that throughout life and this journey that we go on, it is a complicated, complicated uh, woven quilt of experiences and meeting people but also letting go of those people, letting go of those things, letting go of those experiences, whether it's changing your job, changing your house, changing a relationship, you know, people that weave in and out of your life, you have to let some of them go, you can't hang on to them, and some of them we don't have a choice, you know. So. Uh, it, the art of letting go is learning how to recognize this is one of those opportunities that I have to figure out how to let go, how to heal, or how does that manifest in my life? What lesson do I have to learn out of that? Sometimes someone else's tragedy, you know, is is that person's personal experience, but what can we take out of it? It's not like we're looking for a gift in someone else's heartbreak, but there's oftentimes something in it that we can get out for ourselves. And right, it selfish, and makes it kind of makes it kind of easier for you to face whatever things are going on in your life at it the does. time. It Would does. Would you be willing to read us "Letting Go"? I will. Please. I will. Thank you. Okay. So this one was written. Oh, I don't know. Maybe uh, 15 years ago. This was probably one of the older poems that I had written in here. Is there a special story leading into it? Well. It, it goes along with changing relationships and changing addresses and uh, and changing uh, friends and and whether that was on purpose or you know by accident. Those people you have to grieve with every time you let go of something. It's even, I know it's silly, but even taking you know items to the goodwill it's, that mm -hmm. you've hung on to for ten years. Mm -hmm. You know that you don't wear your clothes and you don't sit on that piece of furniture, but you have to figure out a way. How do I emotionally let go mm -hmm. of this? And you know it's kind of like figuring out how to do that and being ready to do that. And you're sharing something we all experience. Everybody experiences okay. letting go. All right, so the art of letting go. One day everything is fine, nothing extraordinary, just routine and habit. Then you awaken to find someone gone, someone died, someone changed, someone fell out of love. And suddenly you have to find the words, goodbye, so long, I'll miss you, it's better this way. And you do this often enough that it becomes expected, just routine and habit. And you wonder if you're cold, if you're conditioned, or if you've mastered the art of letting go. So, mm. you know, we all have to say goodbye. We all have to let go. Uh, we all have to, or we find ourselves in positions where we have to say I miss you, or we should say I miss you. We should let people know how we feel. Um, how many times have we, in 
way back when in past relationships saying it's better this way when maybe we didn't feel that at the time but when you reflect on it you're like wow that's one of the best things that ever happened to me was letting go of that so sometimes when you're in that separation or that period of grieving the separation you can't see what maybe the future has in store for you and you reflect on that and you look in the rearview mirror and you go that had to happen for me to get where I am right now so there's a blessing in in loss you know, and I think about that, and it's right, it's that balance of heartbreak and hope. Yes, and you have to have hope. Mm -hmm. In heartbreak, you have to have hope. That is the one thing that if you don't have, heartbreak lingers, and it grows, and it's fertilized with the, with the absence of hope. And uh, whether hope comes in just a s tiny little spark, you have to figure out how to feed that. You have to figure out a, a way to illuminate that and let it grow in your life and around you and rely on people around you who help that, who help that manifest. And when you talk about that helping, it's like as if your poetry in one sense is healing and in the other sense is inspiring. Do you find that true for yourself? I do. Um, you know, I have my own set of continuous stories of, you know, heartbreak and healing. I have lost most of my family through, you know, death, obviously. Uh, death takes people when we don't want them, no matter how prepared we think we are. We've, uh, we all experience heartbreak on a love level, a romantic level, and that has been one of those things that I've uh, had to develop a skill for letting go of that in, in my life and discerning what's good for me. Because so many times it was always, what's good for the person, what's good for that person's, that other person's feelings, but at some point in your life you feel, feel like, well, wow, I, I've got to take care of myself here, and I've got to heal. And with every heartbreak and every heal, you get stronger and you don't even realize it. And I, that's why I say in the poem, uh, you wonder, you know, if, if you've become conditioned. You don't ever want to become conditioned to letting go, but you do want to try to figure out a way to handle it better so that it doesn't take you absolutely to your knees. Because at a certain point in life, we all know you have to take care of yourself or you, you know, some, Cher said it best in one of her songs, sooner or later we all sleep alone. Mm -hmm. When you're sleeping alone, are you okay to wake up alone? And if the answer to that is yes, you have mastered the art of letting go. Mm hmm. hmm. Let that sit for just a second. Yeah, you gotta right? stew on that yeah. one. I think that requires wine. Yeah, I think and so too. Reflection. I think so. Wine <laughs> and reflection. And you know, the other side of that is sometimes that moment of letting go is when those other doors open, and it's true. just you get flooded with so much beauty and so many things then that you haven't seen before. It tend to come out, and I've seen that in your work too. It's true. I I could probably tell you three different poems in here. Uh, of a, I'll name one experience. Um, I had had a relationship with a man for several years, and um, we just fit like hand in glove for a lot of times. But then there was the opposite side of that where we couldn't. We were oil and water, you know. And we had three breakups. And the first time we broke up, I went and bought myself um, a, a ring, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> not a diamond ring. And the second time we broke up, I went to Mexico just to get away. And the third time we broke up was the final time. And I didn't think I was going to heal from that. I really, truly didn't. It was, uh, uh, I said, we had three good dates and then we spent four years breaking up. Mm -hmm. And there was a point in January of uh, January 18th of 2007, I remember the date because I woke up and it was so cold outside and I didn't think I could breathe without this person in my life. And I actually walked out onto the porch and I saw this beautiful sunrise and the, I love winter anyway, but the cold air just shocked me and this peace came over me and I thought, oh my goodness. I can live without him, and guess what? I love myself. I had never allowed myself to say that before, that I love me enough to say, you are poison, you are toxic. 
I'm going to be okay now. So, but what came, all the other things that came out of it was a lot of good writing, a lot of short stories, a lot of diary and journal entries, a lot of art because I like to paint um, with acrylic. Um, but I got through all of that to think, I can't live without this person. I can't live. And all of a sudden, the veil was removed and I have been a different person ever since. And the same thing happened when my dad passed away 25 years ago. I grieved for the longest time and I was in such a deep depression. And one day driving to work, sunrise, the cold wet weather, maybe that's the combination. Maybe it's not poetry mm -hmm. at all. Um, <laughs> maybe it's all of it. It's all of it. But I just, I woke up and I started smiling again. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe it, I had to grieve. I had to allow myself that time to grieve. And we all heal in our own way and in our own time. And I think it's important for people not to put a time frame on that, you know, to get past a divorce or get past a death or a broken relationship or a change in your life, a job change, a house change or whatever. I think it's really, really important that we understand we're not on anybody's clock and don't set one for yourself. You know, you have to, you heal in your own time. And I think I love that because in I see that in your poems too, that it's almost that permission to take the journey, take the journey in your time and in your space. And it's okay to write your most private thoughts down. Yeah. And even though it's raw and it's vulnerable, there's a healing in that. But there's always, yeah. like you talked about a minute ago with the hope and the, the moment that you think, oh, Aha, I'm good. You have the aha you know? moments. Right, and I'm going to make it. And there's even better things around the corner for me. And you mentioned yep. a second ago about painting. This book also contains your original drawings. They do. Um, they're in black and white, of course, but I, and so they're a little bit more vivid when you see them on canvas. But um, that is also cathartic for me, just getting down there. And uh, trust me, I have painted some really ugly things. And if somebody digs through the layers on some of my canvases, they'll find out they're probably six different uh, attempts to to convey a, a great thought or image but uh, some of these things that I included in the book I thought they came about at a time when I was writing a particular poem so they sort of match the images and words and so I included them at, also for my own entertainment just because I thought you know I can barely uh, keep my crayons inside the the line so you know, it's my book. I'm going to do what That's I want. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'd love to hear another. Would you share another one I will. of these pieces with I us? I will. Thank you. Um, you know, there's one um, here that I think is appropriate, appropriate for the conversation we're having. It's called Winding Roads. Um, so let me read that and we'll, we'll chat. And this is really more a poem to God and to myself. Uh, so Winding Roads. Thank you for the winding roads, every bump and curve and hill. Thank you for a tragic journey and the joy left in me still. Thank you for the rainy days that quench the smallest thirst and thank you for a feeble mind that forgets to put you first. Thank you for a broken heart and tears that stain my face. Thank you for the gift of love in my heart it found its place. Thank you for the winding roads, every detour, every turn. The souvenirs of this magic journey are the lessons that I learn. And so that is really uh, sort of a, a compliment or an extension of the art of letting go. Sometimes, no, all the time, I think we, we see things negative in our li lives or things that happen around us that are horrible, tragic, atrocious, and we all see that in the news almost every single day. And then when we have a chance to let the truth rise to the surface. We have a chance to reflect on it, to think about it deeply from a, a lot of different perspectives, not just a news journalist perspective, but our own perspective and how it applies to our lives. I think we find healing in that too. And that that pain absolutely had to happen. That, I always think of us as being almost like balls in a pinball machine. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking the bumper is going to knock you this way, right? And you end up getting this way and that way mm -hmm. and that way, and that is what adds such rich richness to our lives. And I, I'm just grateful. I I don't wish heartbreak or tragedy on anybody. Obviously, we all want to be happy and feel mm -hmm. joy every single day, but 
there is a magic in taking the bad things that happen and finding joy somehow, some sort of beauty in that. Uh, beauty out of even the death of someone that we love. Um, and that comes after that initial shock and grieving time that we have to, we have to allow ourselves to experience. But afterward, there's, there's beauty in it. Mm. And you know, I heard gratefulness in tiny moments. Yes. Gratefulness for a tear, gratefulness for anything that comes our way. Yeah. Why do you think that's so important and why do you write about it? It's important because I think it's sort of uh, a utopian thought that we can go through life and that everything is going to be happy. Everything's going to bring joy. Everything should be this way. And when things aren't this way, and you see it on social media a lot, people will complain or throw negative comments out there simply because something didn't go the way that they thought it should go and it creates all these emotions in us that we're wrong or we have to be more right than the next person we have to understand that respect is a, you know it's a cornerstone of life it's a cornerstone of humanity we have to respect that uh, people don't feel the same that way that we do and then we have to understand that we have to allow ourselves to feel what we feel Going through this life, we take, hopefully, the best of every single person that we meet. We are the culmination of every single person that we meet. You toss away the bad stuff, you, you don't let the negative stuff in, but hopefully you walk away with the best stuff of every person that you've encountered in your entire life. That's who you are. Um, you, you have a certain DNA, um, and that's the nature part. The nurture part is who you allow yourself to be. I have this thing taped to the top of my monitor at work that says, decide how you want the rest of your life to turn out and make it happen. And so you don't have to be a victim of your circumstances. You can rise above that. And I think everybody has the, the talent to do that. I think everybody has the will to do that if they just allow themselves to feel what they feel, be honest about it, and then move forward. Mm. What advice would you give someone on how to do that? Well, I always think that, um, you know, a lot of people don't allow themselves to cry. I, I cry because I'm a very, I'm an emotional person. I hug, I, you know, I express myself mm -hmm. a lot. And I think we have to first be honest about that and allow yourself to feel emotions and to express them in the right context and in the right uh, environment and then you know sometimes just writing even if you're not a writer you don't have to be able to put a sentence together perfectly grammatically correct you just have to be able to put your thoughts on paper don't worry about whether there's a comma and I say that I'm a pink pen bandit at work but um, <laughs> You know, you have to just let yourself write out your feelings or talk to somebody that you trust with your feelings. Keep a journal. Keep, you know, and put boundaries around the people that you share a home with. You know, if you share a home with someone, you have to make boundaries around your work. Hey, this book is off limits. I will share it with you when I'm ready, when I'm in a good place. But I would respectfully ask that you not take a peek in it out of curiosity. I'll, there'll be a time when I'll, I'll say yes, maybe, that you can take a peek. Mm. Let's take a peek into a little bit further with Robin Sean. What's next? What's next for me? So I love to write and uh, sometimes I say, oh, you're so not a writer. And then I realize you are who you want to be. I'm a writer. Um, I have written a screenplay and I've been shopping it for about three years. It's a romantic comedy. So I'm hoping that I could somehow get that into the hands of people either at Lifetime or Hallmark. Mm -hmm. I have run it by some of my theater friends who are, who have some Emmys sitting on their uh, bookshelves. And they are very encouraging about what I'm doing. I've also written a novella as part of my Holland University thesis uh, pro project. Um, I'm going to expand that novella into a full-blown novel. And I'm just going to keep writing. You know, I'm not in it to be rich and famous. I'm just in it to, um, one, express myself because it, it's cathartic, and two, to have uh, an avenue for being creative. In my job, I get to be creative every day in different kinds of ways, but it's not in the arts and cultural community per se, as in getting to write, paint, um, sculpt, whatever people do. And writing is sort of my thing, so I'm hoping to just keep doing it. It sounds like this almost helps Robin Sean be whole. 
It does. You know, all those pieces that come together through work is one piece of your life, but this is so much more and is a way to be, like you said, so cathartic to get through all the little things that happen in life right. in a way that you can keep it private, but you can also thank, you know, be grateful for all the little moments that come your way and every really little is. thing and all those little blessings that you talked about. You know, I could sit here all afternoon and talk to you because we're, I feel like we barely scratched the surface. And unfortunately, you know, I, I wish I could do that. So we'll have to have, find another time that you can come back and chat with Thank me, right? You. Thank so you. So that would be so much fun. I know that you have been all over the country. Yes. I, for one, would really hope that you decide to keep Roanoke and this area as your permanent home. There's no You're question. You're such a gift to our area. <laughs> well, thank you. Wonderful. And thank you so much for spending time with us and thank you so much for sharing a piece of your heart and a piece of that inside because I think that makes it all so much more real thank for you. people to balance. And I think these words are so hopeful and helpful for others. I hope everyone goes out and has a chance to read Portrait of the Wind because it's beautifully, beautifully done. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for reading my poetry and thank you for allowing me to share some of this with your audience. Well, thank you. Well, we thank Robin Sean for joining us and I will see you next time right around the corner.